Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on Good Sense Food Safety Practices on Organic Vegetable Farms by Chris Blanchard of Purple Pitchfork. This is your host, Alice Formiga from the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at the link on your screen. This webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording on our website as well as on the eOrganic YouTube channel in about a week. I've uploaded a handout of the slides for the webinar and you can find that in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you can't download that for some reason, don't hesitate to contact me. Before we start, I'd like to just give you a quick summary of today's program. The presentation will last about 45 minutes. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, at which time we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. So today, we're very happy to have the opportunity to host our speaker, Chris Blanchard. Chris provides consulting and education for farming, food, and business through Purple Pitchfork. As the owner and operator of Rock Spring Farm for 15 years, he raised 20 acres of vegetables, herbs, and greenhouse crops marketed through a 200-member year-round CSA, food stores, and farmer's markets. Prior to that, Chris managed student farms, worked as an intern and a packing house manager, plant breeding assistant, and farm manager, and he provided consulting for a major organic processor in California, Wisconsin, Maine, and Washington State. So this webinar is going to cover basic steps that you can take to improve the microbiological food safety on your farm. Another webinar in two weeks by Erin Silva will discuss the impact of the Food Safety Modernization Act. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over the screen control to Chris Blanchard. Thank you so much, Alice. All right, so that's just a picture of me to start off the show. I looked that calm once. I think that was about seven years ago, and, and uh, I haven't really stood still since. Um, I've been farming since 1990, got my start at Deep Springs College out in uh, out on the California-Nevada state line. I managed the, the student vegetable production uh, plots out there. We had about, uh, started with a half acre, ended up with about two acres of vegetables in that place. Uh, spent the next 10 years traveling around the country, working on farms and for different kinds of farming operations. Uh, as Alice said, I, I landed in at Rock Spring Farm in 1999. It didn't look like this when we got there. The, the All of the buildings on the farm at that point were falling down. Uh, we proceeded to tear down most of them and, and replace them over the next several years. And um, at Rock Spring Farm, Alice mentioned the ways we were selling our product, but we did a lot of work with, with packaged produce. We, did, uh, we were bagging salad greens. We were washing root crops. We were clamshelling fresh herbs all of which made us really focus on our packing shed operations. And it was it was something that Emilio Cantasano said a long time ago, I, well, or at least that I heard that Emilio Cantasano said a long time ago, that if we want to compete with the rest of agriculture, we, we have to figure out which of their rules we have to play by. And one of the things that I always felt uh, when I was working at farmer's markets was that we needed to play by having product that showed up in the form that people expected it. You know, in other words, carrots needed to come with no dirt on them, not just you know, not just a little dirt rinsed off, but actually clean. Um, salad mix needed to be bagged, ready to eat product. Same thing with the clamshell fresh herbs. People expect to see things that way. It really made us focus on the food safety on the farm and really think hard about the the impacts that was going to have. And even back in in 2005, 2006, when we were planning for the construction of this packing shed, we were looking out into the future and seeing that there was going to be some regulation coming down the pike. Um, and, and we're thinking about how we wanted to structure and do things as a result of that. One of the other things that, that happened is, as I got uh, more involved in food safety, we actually went through a GAPS audit in 2010 on the farm uh, as a result of a local, the local college in Decorah, Iowa wanted to, uh, thought they were going to start doing a lot of sales of, or a lot of purchasing of, of fresh local produce. So we to do that, we had to go through the GAPS audit. Um, so that was an interesting process. Kind of got me really thinking hard about the food safety. Also made me very frustrated with a lot of the information that was out there about food safety. All right, 2013, 2014, I. Um, a variety of personal and professional issues decided to transition off the farm into uh, into doing consulting full time. Uh, the business used to be called Flying Rutabaga Works. Now it's Purple Pitchfork because people can actually spell pitchfork and nobody kn apparently knows how to spell rutabaga. Um, so I do consulting with farms all over the country. Uh, 
you know, primarily with farms, nonprofits. I also uh, produce and host the Farmer to Farmer podcast, which is uh, a weekly interview show with farmers that's, that's uh, available on your iPhone or on your Android device on an on-demand basis. You know, we've got over, I think, over six, well, 58. I think I was just editing episode 58 today. So really want to just uh, to get into what we're actually talking about, because I talk about myself forever, but I want to say, you know, food safety fundamentals. Um, the food safety is, well, it matters, right? I mean, in terms of, you know, in vegetables. I mean, obviously, you know, making your customers sick isn't a very good idea, but it's also, you know, in fresh vegetables, it's 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 a lot more present than it is in other areas of agriculture because with fresh produce, oftentimes we're the last step before product actually goes in somebody's mouth. You know, much of what we produce, customers are taking home and they're either minimally processing it, uh, and you know, in other words, sli washing it and slicing it, um, or they're just putting it straight in their mouth, and so there might not. Be in mo for a lot of the produce that we're selling, there might not be what we would call in the food safety world a kill step that happens between somebody buying our product and somebody actually ingesting that product. In in recent years, and when I started giving this presentation some time ago, this the, this was more applicable. I think more people are aware of this now, but um, almost all food poisoning is a result of things traveling through the fecal oral route. You have foodborne pathogens um, such as salmonella, certain strains of E. coli, listeria, uh, viruses like rotavirus and norovirus um, that are in fecal material. And, and then somebody eats that fecal material, usually unknowingly, of course, and, and then they get sick. And almost all the time when somebody has what we call the 24-hour flu, when they've got that, you know, the usually comes on fairly suddenly, not necessarily a fever associated, but got the vomiting, they've got the diarrhea, and then it and then it's going to clear up later. Almost always that's a food poisoning issue. We don't think of it that way, but I think in part because it's kind of unpleasant to think about the uh, fecal oral route. But really what it means is that most of the time when you've got symptoms that are like vomiting and diarrhea, it's because you ate feces from either an animal or from another human being that got on your food. In recent years, we've also become more aware of the need for food safety because the, the infectious dose they found is actually a lot lower than previous thought, previously thought. It used to think it take, took quite a, a chunk of bacteria to make somebody sick. That's not actually the case. Um, the other issue that we've got is, is now, because a lot of people, so I give this talk to, well, I mean, farmers like me, you know, we were, we were dirty hippies. I had hair down to the middle of my back, and we homeschooled and did the whole nine yards. And and a lot of times when I give this talk to folks, they'll say, well, you know, all you know, the reason why people are getting sick from food is they just need to make their immune systems better. You know, maybe they need to roll around in, in some dirt, and maybe if they actually ate more dirt, they would be healthier. And that works for a certain percent of the population, but for about one in six people in the United States, they're immune compromised in some way or another. Statistics vary on this, but we're talking about people who are maybe going through chemotherapy, folks that have autoimmune deficiency. Somebody who's had an organ transplant is going to be immune compromised almost for the rest of their life. The elderly and the very young, and in fact, if you look at who tends to die in food safety outbreaks, it's two-year-olds and people who are over 75. And that'll account for most of the people who, who succumb to, to foodborne illnesses in a fatal way. So we've got a very large population of people with immune compromised. So it's one thing to say, you know, for my own family, I we're going to go roll in the dirt and, and beef up our immune system. But there's about one-sixth of the population from that just isn't even a possibility. And, of course, you don't know when you're selling your product at a store through the CSA or even a farmer's market if somebody's got either has those conditions or is taking that food home to somebody that has that condition. Now, of course, it also is a legal responsibility to, to provide safe produce. And this actually predates the Food Safety Modernization Act or the FSMA. Um, it's been illegal for a long time to ship adulterated produce. And produce that has uh, foodborne pathogens on it is considered to be adulterated. But it's not just a legal responsibility, of course. It's an ethical obligation to your customers. Again, like I said, it never makes sense to kill the people that are buying your food. It's also an ethical obligation to the local foods community. 
And I want to go through an example of what happened. And this wasn't a local foods issue, but in 2006, the uh, we had the what in the food safety world they call the 9/11 of the of the produce world. It was um, it was when we had that E. coli outbreak in the in the fresh spinach. And one of the things, so when we had that E. coli outbreak that year, 2006, there were 50 billion servings of fresh cut salad greens sold and fresh cut and bagged salad greens sold in this country 50 billion servings and not very many people got sick there were only 276 people who actually got sick and whose illnesses were traced back to that particular outbreak and you know the really shocking number for me given all of the fallout over this is how many people died it was only 3 now 3 out of 50 billion I'd say those are pretty good odds that eating spinach is a pretty safe activity. But you know what? Spinach sales are still down. They've never recovered to pre-2006 levels. What that means at a practical level is if you've got a community or a, a, not just a crop but, a, but a, a, a community of providers, say folks that are selling into the farm to school program, and somebody gets sick out of that, or so we have an outbreak that's definitively traced back to farmer's market sales, suddenly you can bet that the, the media is going to grab a hold of this, and they're going to be like a dog with a bone, and they're not going to let go until they completely killed that industry, because that's what people do, and people don't have a rational assessment of risk. Okay. Now, of course, I, I and I sometimes come off as a little bit cavalier about this. Again, I cite this example with the spinach outbreak, the three people that died were two elderly people and a, and a two-year-old. Um, it, it's, they were folks that were, I mean, the elderly people were people that were, you know, 20 years ago, we would have said they died of old age, and now they die of foodborne illness outbreak. I mean, the kid, that's, that's a little bit of a different story for how we would tend to address that from a public health standpoint. But it's not very risky. But then, of course, when you hear about the two-year-old dying and you think about the kid's parents, um, you think about the kid. You know, we ask how much risk is too much. You know, it's, it, it becomes it's always easy to assess risk in a numerical standpoint, and it becomes a lot harder when you put names and faces on it. A lot of people would say then they go, well, hey, those spinach that spinach outbreak that was a big mega farmer out in California. You know, that has nothing to do with us. Small farms are safer. I don't buy it. I've been on a lot of small farms. I've spent a lot of time looking at food safety issues on small farms, and I'd say small farms aren't safer. Uh, and there's actually no data to back that up. The reason why we tend to detect outbreaks from in, in the national produce distribution is because of the size of that. So if we're looking at an outbreak of, you know, what do we say, about 279 people who got sick or died out of, out of you know, 50 billion servings of fresh bag salad greens, that's a pretty... That's a pretty small number, and it took a lot of cases for that to show up on the radar. If you're selling produce and you make one or two of your customers sick, it's unlikely that that's ever going to come back to you. Again, this is something I hear from a lot of farmers will say, uh, I, my produce has never made anybody sick. Nonsense. The, presence of, the, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Okay, the fact that we haven't had a large number of outbreaks that have been traced back to small farms doesn't mean they're safer. It means that we haven't tracked them back to small farms because of ways that that, that information flows, and because, of course, people don't just turn and immediately try to blame it on small organic farms. And a lot of times, ignorance is is really the enemy. When I, when I say small farms aren't safe, aren't any safer than large farms, it's it's not due to malfeasance. And it's not due to um, you know, anybody willfully ignoring uh, good food safety practices. I say a lot of times it's simply because people don't know. They aren't they aren't putting together the pieces of the puzzle that go towards making a safe food environment. And you know, I'd even say one of the hardest things about this, you know, we had the cantaloupe outbreak in 2011. The Jensen brothers passed their third-party food safety audit with a score of, I think it was 96 out of 100. Uh, that was with a company called Primus, so it wasn't even with the USDA audit, it was with a stricter audit. Uh, they passed that audit three days before the outbreak started. And, you know, the, all, that they, all that they had done, and they were obviously doing a lot of things right, wasn't necessarily enough to, to prevent the, the, the outbreak. I'm not certain that anything would have been in that situation. 
the good news is, I mean, food safety is pretty easy. It's pretty simple. Uh, there's really three straightforward principles that we want to follow when we're talking about food safety. The first is that we want to keep the poop off the food. That seems pretty fundamental, right? We want to keep things that have, we want to keep fecal material from ending up on the produce. We want to keep things that might have come in contact with fecal material from coming in contact with the produce. That all makes a lot of sense until we think about the fact that we live in a poop-filled world. You know, um, I actually remember when I had my food safety audit, the, the, our, our resident bald eagle had recently flown over the field and taken a dump on the salad greens. You know, now that didn't disqualify us from the audit, but it meant that we had a food safety hazard that we needed to have addressed. Can't do anything about that, right? And you want a scary thing here, even slugs have been shown to carry salmonella. And I'm certainly not proposing that we all put up little electric fences around each head of lettuce to keep the slugs out. But understanding that everything that we do to keep the poop off the food, we want to go into this next step with the assumption that there's poop on the food because there's a chance that there might be. So then we want to keep the poop from spreading. Primarily, poop spreads because it gets on to a, onto a food handling surface, a tote, a glove, a knife, or because it goes into a tank of water and it gets um, and it and then you end up with maybe you've got you've got uh, that eagle poop on a couple leaves of lettuce and then you put it in with another hundred pounds of lettuce all in the same tank and now you've got a whole tank full of lettuce soaking in poop soup. So we're going to talk about how we keep that from happening. And then we also want to keep the poop from growing. Now, of course, those aren't salmonellas. Um, you know, most, most of the foodborne illness problems that we have are with bacteria and viruses, not with fungus. But to try to find a picture of poop growing, it's not so easy. Although here's one. This is, um, this is a picture of, uh, of E. coli uh, multiplying. And just, you know, this is really a matter of uh, primarily of creating an environment that is, is not hospitable to those foodborne uh, pathogens to, to grow and reproduce, whether that's growing and reproducing in your packing shed or growing and reproducing in your, uh, you know, on your, on your food because it's being stored at a high temperature. With that, I'd like to dive into our 10 simple steps for safer food. Alice and I were talking before the before the show today, and we were kind of laughing because when I sent her the original description for this, it, it was the title was 12, and and the description said 11, and I ended up cutting it down to 10 because we don't have a whole lot of time today. Um, I've done it up to 16. These are just some basics, and like I say, it, you know, it varies, but these are the things. These are the 10 things that I think are the absolute most important. And one of the problems that I have with a lot of what happens in the food safety world is it's food safety theater. It's not really things that are going to have an effect on food safety. There are things that look like they're going to have an effect on food safety or that it seems logical might have effect, an effect on food safety. But I really want to focus on the things that actually do have an impact on it. So again, I'm just going to say it's all about the poop. We want to keep the poop off the food. We want to keep the poop from spreading. We want to keep the poop from growing. And the first and most important thing that we can do is wash your hands. Now, if I hadn't promised to do 10 steps, I'd say you all can go home now. Because this is the one that really matters the most. We use our hands for everything, right? And our hands and all of our skin is covered with bacteria. This is a this is an electron micrograph of some skin, and you can see the bacteria. You see the hair follicles and the hair growing, and then the bacteria actually down there on the surface of the skin. Uh, it's there, and so we wanna we wanna be washing our hands frequently and and before we're handling the produce. And this is so important because. Well, we handle things with our hands. We handle food with our hands. We handle um, we handle uh, crates with our hands. We even if we're going to put gloves on, we handle the gloves with our hands. Now, so when we talk about about hand washing, there are some things that are really important when we consider this. The first is that you want to be using running water. Now. That doesn't have to be running water coming out of a pressurized well system. This can be running water coming out of a out of a tank that sits on the side of a sink. Um, and we'll we'll throw some pictures up in a little bit of what that can actually look like. But you want the water running over your hand because again, if we think about this, the assumption here is that somehow or another I've gotten some feces on my hand. 
It's not necessarily because you didn't do a good job of wiping. It could be because somebody else didn't do a good job of wiping, and then you grab the doorknob on the, on the bathroom, and now you've got feces on your hand. Or maybe you were out in the field, and you were handling a tote that got set down in a pile of deer feces, and now you've, you've handled that tote, and you've gotten your hands contaminated. So if you take those contaminated hands and you put them in a bucket of water or a sink full of water, now you're just washing your hands again in poop soup. We don't want to do that. We want, the, we want the water to be running over our hands and taking those contaminants away. We need to use soap. Now, I don't encourage you to use bar soap. I'd like to see you using single soap, but this just happened to be the one that was on the set of pictures that I found about washing your hands. Okay? And, and I want everybody now to take their hands for a moment and um, get back to this. There we go. Okay, and, and rub them together. Rub them together really vigorously, and you'll feel them start to warm up. You know, you remember when you first discovered you could do this when you were about six or seven years old, and it was really cool. That's the kind of vigor that you want to be washing your hands with. It needs to be a firm pressure on there, because what you're trying to do is to break all those things loose. The, the soap does a certain amount to loosen things up, but then your job is to get the rest of the way, to really be scrubbing those particles off. Here, we're rubbing our fingers between our other fingers, so it's not just a matter of, of washing the palms of your hands, but getting into all of the cracks and the crevices. We want to take our fingernails and rub them on the back of our hands. That drives that soap up into those fingernails. Okay. We want to rub the palms of our hands. And, and you know, when you're a vegetable farmer, a lot of times you take pride in the fact that you have those you know, that, that part of your hand that you can never actually get clean. Well, I'll tell you what, if you've got clay particles that are permanently stuck on your hands, that's a place where bacteria are hiding too. Bacteria and clay particles are about the same size. So you start to get all that stuff, that's a, it's an indicator that your hands aren't actually clean. So take those fingers and really rub and try to break up what's going on in your lifeline and all those other things that you got in there. Now when you're done, you're going to rinse your hands again, and then you're going to use a single-use towel. Now, a lot of us don't like single-use towels because we're, we're interested in saving the planet. That's part of why we got involved in organic farming in the first place. If that's the case, um, you know, you've got a couple of options. You can use cloth towels, but you just use them once. You know, buy 100 cheap kitchen towels from Amazon, um, <coughs> excuse me, and, and you know, dry your hands once and throw it in the hamper. Okay. Or you could also buy recycled paper towels, and that's good for the recycling industry, which encourages more recycling. So you can actually think of yourself as doing your part with, with trying to promote recycling in America. Um, but we're going to take those towels, and this is, uh, again, the single-use towels, just like the poop soup. You don't want to be using a towel that somebody used before you when they didn't do a good job. And a single-use towel, make sure you're the only person that's responsible for that. Now, if I was doing this in person, I'd, I'd actually walk up and shake somebody's hand. Now, if I shake your hand with a, with a wet hand and you've got dirt on your hand, I'm going to suddenly, and my hand's wet, even if the dirt's dry on your hand, my hand's wet, I'm going to pick up soil from your, from your hand. Same thing with the bacteria. The same thing's going to be true for spreading it. If my hand is wet... Okay, and, and your hand is, is dry, and I've got soil on my hand, then you're suddenly going to have a lot more mud on your hand than if my hand was dry and dirty. So you want to dry your hands thoroughly before you go out into the work area because, again, we're assuming that things are still contaminated. We'd like to believe that we're doing a, a good job of getting our hands clean, but we always want to assume that things aren't perfect, and that's why we want to continue to take those extra steps when it comes to food safety. It's not necessary to use antibacterial soap. Uh, the, the issue, um, well, I know there's, there's a lot of issues with antibacterial soap, but it's, they're, it's, they're no more effective than modern soaps are. Um, hand sanitizer is not an option. It's not, excuse me, it's not a substitute for hand washing because hand sanitizers don't work in the presence of soil. So if you've got perfectly clean hands, then hand sanitizers are an acceptable substitute. But if your hands aren't perfectly clean, then it doesn't make sense. And you know, even if you're in the hospital or in the doctor's office, you notice they aren't using hand sanitizer before they before they touch you. They're using soap and and good washing techniques. 
Hot water also isn't necessary. Now, hot water is advanced with, with modern soaps. Hot water doesn't increase their effectiveness. What hot water really does is it increases the likelihood that somebody's actually going to wash their hands in it. In my area here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, we're run about 45 degrees ground temperature. So that's what the water's coming out at. And, you know, holding your hands under 45 degree water for the 20 second recommended water washing time is pretty unpleasant. So we want to be thinking about making things comfortable for our employees. One of the things that, that I did on my farm is, is to put in this instant hot water heater right next to our hand wash sink. Uh, that was also nice for me as somebody who didn't like watching my employees stand around waiting for the hot water to come. So I think it's important to have a hand washing sink that's dedicated. Um, I, I should, I'm actually going to rephrase that. It is important to have a hand washing sink that's dedicated to that purpose. It shouldn't be being used for other tools. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. Now, this hand washing setup is far from perfect, but I'm just going to say, if your, if you know, if your, if your choice is imperfect hand washing or perfect hand washing, please go for imperfect hand washing. Okay, these guys just have a hose and a breaker. You can see they don't have single-use towels. That's no good. Um, they do have push soap. That's great. Um, I don't like the fact that there's pliers sitting on the back of that and that there's a towel drying on the side of the of the sink. Here's another example of a hand washing sink that's again not perfect but is serviceable. This is a, a farm that actually doesn't have running water in their packing shed, which I still befuddles me to this day um, but they they're using a, a blue jug it's got a it's got a, a turn spigot on it it goes into the sink you can see the bucket down below that's going to capture the water that comes out of the sink so that it's not splashing on your boots because again you don't want the poop water splashing on your boots and then you can see the single use towels off to the left there now I would much rather see you have a setup like I showed two slides back here where you have a you know a real sink where you've got hot water where it's draining into a septic system where you've got soap mounted to the wall and paper towels mounted to the wall that's all fantastic but of course not everybody can do that so do what you do get the best system that you can get keeping in mind the basics that we talked about running water running water that gets moved someplace away from your boots and away from where traffic is happening uh, soap that's in a in a pump bottle and single-use towels. When do you need to wash your hands? Well, the list usually goes, you need to wash your hands after you've used the bathroom, after you've been smoking, after you've been petting animals, after you've been eating. But really, I like to think of it this way. You need to be washing your hands before you touch food and before touching things that are going to touch food. Okay, so if you're going to be, for example, on my farm, putting labels on plastic clamshells, you need to wash your hands before you do that because those clamshells are going to be coming in contact with the food. If you're going to be washing totes, wash your hands. Okay, so on my farm, we adopted a policy that said everybody washed their hands before they returned to work. So if you were going to work for the first time in the morning, you washed your hands, and if you're going to work again in the afternoon, you know, after lunch, you need to wash your hands. Okay. We wanted, you really can't wash your hands too often from a food safety standpoint. And again, if there was one thing that I could do on farms to improve the food safety, this would be it. I think that we would get 95% of the results right here. Don't, well, always, I'm just going to say, always wash your hands before touching the food or anything that touches food. If you walk out of the packing shed, Wash your hands when you come back in. If you, um, before you go out to harvest your crops out in the field, wash your hands. If you're going to be uh, out in the field and using a, a toilet out there, make sure that once you're done doing that, you wash your hands. All right, number two, sick people don't work. Now, this is a, this is a hard one on farms, right? Because when we talk about sick people, sick people not working, a lot of times we're dealing with employees that don't have paid vacation and and for whom they're not making a lot of money. But we again, this is where we want to recognize what I said earlier: vomiting and diarrhea are almost always a result of foodborne illness. Okay, and if that's the case, well, let's take this into account too. A quarter cup of norovirus could sicken everybody in the United States, right? We're not talking about needing to see the contamination, okay? It just has to be there. And in fact, it's likely that we're not going to see it. Because if somebody comes to work with vomiting and diarrhea, vomiting and diarrhea are an explosive event. 
when that stuff comes out of your body and it hits the water or it hits the side of the porcelain bowl, it's actually coming out at a very high velocity and it smacks into the water and it smacks into the bowl and it, and it aerosolizes. So all of a sudden, even though you can't see it, when you've got diarrhea or vomiting, your whole bathroom is filled with a fog of poop. It's a fog of fecal material, and you've got fecal material everywhere, on your shirt, on your pants, on the handles of the sink. Okay? So now you might wash your hands, but the rest of you is also contaminated, and it's very, very difficult to avoid that. So we don't want people coming to work and contaminating the food environment that everybody else is in. Number three, shut out the animals. Now, this is one that I oftentimes gets a lot of focus, right? But when we talk about shutting out the animals, we're not talking about just uh, wild critters. We're talking about domestic animals, too. I've seen what my dog rolls in, and I want no part of that in my packing shed. Okay? Um, we want to think about denying habitat for, for critters in the wintertime. Uh, this farm did this by simply not putting their tank down on the ground. They propped it up so any mice that are running through there, they don't have a nice place to stay. Okay. Um, monitoring for pests is an important uh, thing to do. So in your packing shed, using traps, making sure that you use them in the correct way. On In this example here, I mean, note the entrance to this trap is put right along the wall. Okay, This is in a walk-in cooler. By the way, that is not a dead mouse. It just looks like it. It was a lousy picture. Um, but the, the, there's a, uh, excuse me, this is where rodents are going to travel. Is along here, and if I want to catch rodents, which is what I remember, we're not about food safety theater. We're about actually monitoring what's going on in our packing shed areas. We want to be setting those traps up so that we can catch them. And you'll see that this trap also has a clear top, makes it easy to monitor. On my farm, we monitored once a week for those things. Um, the, and and then if we if we found that we had a problem, then we went into action using baited traps at that point. Using poisons in your packing shed is not a good idea because a mouse that gets poisoned is usually going to walk off someplace to die, and that's likely to be in your produce, and you don't want that. Um, domestic animals don't belong in the packing shed. Okay, so I say that they, those don't they don't mix with vegetables. Okay, uh, using screens to keep birds and insects out. Um, and you can, on this farm, this is actually, whoops, I'm sorry, I went too far. This is a, on, on here, the, this screen is on a farm that has, this is a GAPS audited farm that does a lot of salad mix, but this is on a place that has um, an outdoor packing area that's covered with a roof. So they just hung these screens down, that keeps the birds out, and it, and it helps, with the, helps with the insects. Okay? Not of keeping birds from roosting, using things like bird netting, relatively inexpensive. Managing your water is also important. Okay, we're talk about you know we use water on vegetable farms. You know I'm mostly concerned from a from a real food safety standpoint. The thing that really worries me is is getting contaminated water in the packing shed. Okay, so I want to be testing my water. Uh, I would encourage you to do it if you've got well water in your packing shed. I would encourage you to test your water on a quarterly basis. Okay, I think that's a good frequency to do it. Um, the other thing we want to do when we talk about managing our water is to make sure the water is appropriate, not just in terms of, of being not having any contamination, but also doesn't become a source of contamination. So when we've got a bunch of stuff in a tank, we want to use a product like Tsunami 100. There's a variety of other products out there, including, including using chlorine bleach, that you can use as a wash water sanitizer. Okay? Wash water sanitizers, oh, when you use those, you want to make sure you test it. You don't just put in the amount that you think you need to put in. Put in what you think you need to put in, and then actually take the moment and test to make sure that the concentration is correct. The important thing to understand about wash water sanitizers is that they, they do reduce the microbial load on the produce itself, but their most important role is to keep the, the bacteria from moving from one piece of produce to another. It would kill any bacteria that are that are you know, in just in the water itself. But when you when you're putting the the produce in that water that's in the treated water that's been treated a product like a parasitic acid or chlorine bleach or other san wash water sanitizer, it doesn't actually remove all of the bacteria. Okay? And this is the picture, this is a bottom of a lettuce leaf, and you can see the E. coli right up here. Okay, those are E. coli bacteria that are surviving in that stoma, that, that, that 
uh, hole on the bottom of the leaf where that allows the water to come in and out. Now, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get wash water into the stoma because that opening is so small and the surface of the surface tension of the wash water. But then the other problem here is that this is where in that stoma it's a very nutrient rich environment. It's a great place for bacteria to grow. So uh, we're actually all kinds of problems when we're, we're dealing with that. So don't harvest prod product that has fecal contamination on it. If you've got a piece of bro uh, a head of broccoli out in the field and a bird's taking a dump on it, don't harvest that head of broccoli. The other thing, though, when we're talking about managing our water is to think about this, this important rule with making sure that we don't get, we're not washing hot, hot, fruit, hot fruiting crops in cold water. Okay? If you put hot peppers, hot tomatoes, hot melons into cold water, they'll actually, the pressure differential will cause water to be sucked inside of that fruit. And now if you've got any bacteria in that water, boy, now it just thinks it's died and gone to heaven. It's in this dark, moist, sweet, sugary environment, and it's just going to go to town. Okay? So the rule of thumb here is know that the wash water shouldn't be any more than 10 degrees colder than the interior temperature of the fruits that you're washing in it. So what you want to do here is you take a thermometer and you stick it inside that pepper and make sure in my area we have wash water at 45 degrees. I want to make sure that I've cooled the peppers to at least 55 degrees before I run them through, the, uh, before I submerge them in water and create that risk. Okay, cleaning and sanitizing. Um, we want to be cleaning and sanitizing all of our surfaces as often as it makes sense to do it. Um, this is obviously a balancing act. I, I would, you know, if I was a food safety, uh, uh, if, I, if I was crazy about food safety, I would say, you know, well, boy, you want to wash your, you want to wash your surface between every bag of salad mix. But that's insane, right? I recommend washing surfaces in the packing shed at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, and then again at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. Um, Totes, I don't really have a recommendation on. I think it's a lot harder to come up with a good number on that. I'm continuing to work with, with people to try to get a, a better recommendation on that. Uh, tools certainly should be being washed and sanitized at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. And, and cleaning and sanitizing your tools, so it's, it's actually, a, here's the process we're going to go through, is the first thing we want to do then is to rinse things off. So again, this would be what you would do if you were doing a knife, if you were doing a table, if you were doing a, a tank. Okay, same thing applies in all of these situations. We're going to rinse to remove uh, dirt and, and loose organic matter and debris. Okay? We're going to clean using elbow grease or a detergent to actually loosen up this next layer of dirt here. We want to really get that broken up so that we can rinse it and move it away. And then we want to put we want to put a hard surface sanitizer. On that, and I will note, having talked just talked about uh, wash water sanitizers, that you have to make sure that your sanitizer is is suitable for the purpose you're using it for. So, use a, a hard surface sanitizer for washing your stainless steel and your knives and your uh, your totes. Use a wash water sanitizer for killing bacteria in the wash water. Two different two different purposes, two different labels, uh, and then and then you're done. So. All right, right place and right tools. We want to be thinking about ways. This is a, I mean, this isn't a right place. This was on my farm in 2002. This was a, uh, well, boy, I, st I still get flashbacks when I when I get this. This was not a good lettuce harvest seed. But what we had done right from a food safety standpoint is that we were trying to get the produce up off of the ground. Now we were doing it because we wanted it out of the mud, but in this case it actually was was serving a food safety purpose there as well because we don't know what's happened out in those fields overnight. So getting the produce up off the ground is always a good idea. Okay? Variety of different packing sheds can work. You know, I'm not going to say that one thing is better than another. The one thing I will say is if I was building a packing shed from scratch tomorrow, the very first thing I would do is pour the concrete. I think this is where you actually make the biggest difference in terms of your facilities because now you've got a washable, rinsable floor. You can clean the floor. You can effectively remove uh, plant material. You know, you, if you've got gravel and you step on a cucumber that fell, falls on a gravel floor, you're never going to get that cleaned up. Okay? The, having, a, having a concrete floor gives you the ability to do that and serves as a good foundation for whatever you're going to do next. Washable walls are also important. Okay. Uh, using totes and other materials that were designed for handling produce or for handling food, 
okay? using knives and other equipment that is designed for handling food and things. And I would just say here, you know, you know, if you're looking at what what harvest knives you're going to use, you don't want to use a wooden handled knife that's got rivets in it because when that wood dries out. Um, and then swells and dries out and swells, it gets loose, and then that becomes a place where uh, dirt and bacteria can get inside the holes where the rivets were in between the tang and the knife blade and, and start to grow. So you want things that can be cleaned easily, and I really like the, you know, just going and buying the standard field knives. If they start to get loose, throw them out and get another one. Okay. Number six, securing your supplies. So this is mostly just a matter of making sure that your boxes, bags, and other things are protected at least to some degree from contamination. Wow, I'm not really a big fan of the fact that somebody's storing their jeans on top of the boxes that the produce is going to go into. But what I do like here is that we've at least got the cardboard on top of it and stuff's up on pallets. That's going to keep a lot of contamination from getting on these no matter what gets into this storage space. Okay. Uh, just another example of storage spaces. I will say here that as, you're, as you are securing your supply, you do want to make sure you've got some space or a procedure so that you're checking this area back here behind, the, uh, behind those pallets. Okay. That's actually a place where rodents, mice, uh, rats might want to might want to take up residence or might want to be moving through there. So you'd want to be pulling those pallets out on a weekly basis and taking a peek behind there, making sure that you're not seeing mouse poop, rat poop, or that greasy stripe of, of rat slime that, all, that appears along the side of a wall when you have a lot of trafficking there. Just another example of storing stuff. All right, number seven, keep it off the floor. Okay. Uh, by definition, the floor and the ground are considered to be contaminated. Yeah, this is a hard one, right? We grow vegetables in soil and then, you know, then we're like, oh, now the soil's contaminated. But, you know, it's hard to say what's happened in the soil, and especially you get out into the into the grassy areas on your farm, or you're not watching every square foot. For the most part, we want to keep things from coming in contact with the floor, and that would include things like packaging. Okay, so you know this is just an example of packaging up on pallets, and the bins are up. Um, this is a small pallet system that we used on our farm. These pallets cost us about a dollar fifty each. We had a manufactured at a at a local pallet company. That um, we sized them to fit our tote, so they they worked well with our hand cart. Even this situation here, um, this isn't perfect, right? These, are, these things are being stored outside, but again, I at least like the fact that they're up off the ground. You're just that much less likely to have somebody taking up residence in there if you do that. And then, of course, keeping your work surfaces up off the ground. If you've got boxes that you're packing into, you know, having a crate that separates those boxes from the floor okay, for positioning. And then one of the things that we like to do on our farm was this, we called it a drag tote. I actually learned this from the folks up at uh, Red Cardinal Farm in Stillwater, Minnesota. They're out of business now. Um, but they had, they taught us to use drag totes. So we had a, a, a stack and nest uh, tote system and we always had one tote for each worker that was designated as their drag tote in the field. That was nice because it also kept the dirt out of the out of the product, but it also made sure that the bottom of that crate that actually has the food in it doesn't come in contact with any potential fecal contamination out there in the field. We want to think about separating our functions. So when we say separating functions, that means that means we want to separate the get it clean process from the keep it clean process. Okay. Now I'm going to say here, this is a barrel washer, so I'm standing in front of my computer screen right now, right, and I'm putting dirty beets, these are dirty Kyoja beets, into my barrel washer, right? So I've got all the dirty functions happening down here, and then somebody else is down, which also happens to be me, but down at the other end of the end of the barrel, taking the clean beets out. Now that becomes, right, that's, now I've got dirty things happening in one place, clean things happening in another. And of course, if there's a potential that the dirt's contaminated in any way, I want to keep those two functions separate. It also works really well from a washing and packing standpoint. You don't want your dirty beets next to your clean beets. Same sort of setup here. This is a long, skinny room at Featherstone Farm in Rushford, Minnesota that they used for packing. So they've got dirty carrots down at the other end. They're putting them in the brush washer, running them down towards this, this guy in the brown sweater. He's down at the clean and dry end, and you can see that he's got his boxes stacked in a way that's keeping them off the floor, keeping it clean. Pallet, things are going onto the pallet, so they're not ending up on the floor. If you're doing any kind of packaging, I strongly encourage you to either separate that packaging in time or in space from the other operations that are happening in your packing shed. You don't want to be running a barrel washer at the same time 
for example, that you're you're putting product into a bag into the same space. You know, that would just be that'd be bad. You, you're creating too much potential for contamination. We really want to again get it clean in one place keep it clean in another space. We did a lot of packaging on our farm, so when we built our packing shed, we actually created a separate room for that to happen in, but a time separation does also work. And then the separation of functions is also thinking about different tools for different purposes. So on, on my farm, we used a, a three color coding system for all of the tools in the packing shed. So green was things that we could use for, for washing or handling vegetables. Uh, Blue was for uh, was for washing or or any kind of contact with food contact surfaces. So this is blue brush is what we would have used to scrub the totes, for example. And then the red brushes were for uh, was was what we used for non food contact surfaces. So if we needed to clean the walls, for example. Um, that's what we would use. Or if we were cleaning out the inside of our refrigerated truck and scrubbing it down, we'd use red brushes for that. So that gave us those three different things. Now, what was nice about having the, the clear color coding system is we could apply it to things other than brushes. For example, we had a scoop shovel that we used for, uh, for scooping up our, our mud, okay, and that we painted red because that was for, for non-food contact stuff, right? We were scooping it up off the floor. We also had a scoop shovel that we used for scooping up shallots out of our bins. Uh, we did a lot of shallots. We had this funny processing system where we ended up with a layer on the bottom. We found that having the scoop shovel worked, but we needed to label that so that the only thing that it got used for was for use with the food. And the green is a lot more effective than just having something on there that says food use only, for example. And you know, then the same thing, right? If we want to think about our containers, we painted some containers red that were designated as compost containers. So compost is not food. It doesn't go in food containers, and food doesn't go in anything other than food containers. So by having this color, by having these painted red, that indicated that that's where the that's where the waste products went. Number nine, keep things cool. The rate of metabolic activity roughly doubles for every 10 degrees increase in temperature. Uh, that's Celsius scale, but what that effectively means is that uh, as your product gets warmer, the rate of growth actually accelerates. So uh, if, if you've got product at, at 10 degrees Celsius, that's gonna, the, it's gonna deteriorate and the bacteria are going to grow at, at at, uh, at half of the rate that they will at 20 degrees Celsius or a quarter of the rate that they will at 30 degrees Celsius. So it's a very fast ramping up of, of temperatures there, of speed. And the thing that happens when you start to get deterioration in your product, so this, is, this doesn't really necessarily go along with keeping it cold, but it does somewhat. By the way, it's really hard to find pictures of, of like a not very rotten cantaloupe. You're either like looking at perfect cantaloupes or really rotten cantaloupes. So I went for the really rotten ones here. But all of these spaces where there's wounds on the plant, those are places where bacteria are going to grow. So when your plant, when your produce starts to break down, the rot organisms aren't necessarily foodborne pathogens. But if there are any foodborne pathogens there, when the when the the rot organisms start to take effect, they actually break things down at the cellular levels. The cells start to leak goop, and and that sugary sweet goop, high in nutrients, though that's an ideal place the E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria, all those other things to grow and multiply. So we we really want to have the best quality stuff is also going to be the most food safe stuff, and anything that we can do to prevent things from going bad in our coolers, okay by, again, having proper temperature storage is also going to create an inhospitable environment for uh, bacteria, for the foodborne pathogens to grow. All right, number 10, wash your hands again. Now, I just want to say that, right? If we're not talking about food safety theater, if we're talking about how to actually make things effective on the farm, okay, we want to, have a, we want to change food safety on our farms. This one and then number two, is, is not letting sick people work and not working when you're sick. Those two things, I would be willing to bet 95 to 99% of the problems uh, would be eliminated for, for food safety concerns uh, at, the, at the fresh produce handling level and probably throughout the entire chain of handling after we get done with it. So that's the end of the lecture portion of the, of the conversation here. I do want to say, um, 
another picture of me here. This is, God, these are these are old. I've got a lot more gray hair now. Um, but I do put out a weekly newsletter. It's available at purplepitchfork.com slash newsletter. If you're interested in picking that up, we talk about everything from suits, food safety to employee management, but it's kind of a way to keep in touch with, with what's going on uh, in my world. And then, um, yeah, and check out the podcast. And, and I guess now we're going to do some questions and answers. Right, Alice? Right. Thank you, Chris. Um, also, if you have general questions about organic farming, you're very welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. And after you've had a little time to copy down Chris's information here, if you want it, um, we will um, advance to the link to that on the, on the next slide. So um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, first one is that quarterly water testing suggestion that you mentioned um, to send it off to a lab um, each time. And what exactly are we most interested in testing for? And are there any home kits available that could accomplish this? Wow, three great questions. Yeah. Yes, please send that off to a lab. What you want to do is to, and, and, and I'd say even if there was a home testing kit available, um, I think that the, the home testing is fairly expensive, and you're probably not going to get the same accuracy that you would get by sending it off to a lab. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I do recommend sending it off to the lab. We were farming in Iowa, and Iowa State University's uh, or I guess it was University of Iowa uh, Water Hygiene Department had a they had water testing. I think it cost us fifteen dollars per sample. Uh, so we would actually just buy a whole year's supply of water sample kits at a time, and then when it showed up on our calendar, we would we would do the packaging. We would we would uh, take the sample, uh, package it up, take it to town, and send it in. Um, the, let's see, the other, the other part of that question is what we're testing for. So what we're really looking for is the presence of, um, of coliform bacteria. So we're, we're looking for the presence of bacteria that indicate that there might be some fecal contamination in your, in your water. They don't actually test for the presence or absence of, of uh, foodborne pathogens. They're actually, they're, it's an indirect test for for the possibility that those foodborne pathogens could be there. Uh, nitrate levels is something we oftentimes get questions about. From a food safety perspective, uh, from a, let, me, let me put this really carefully, from a microbiological food safety perspective in fresh produce, I don't really care about how many nitrates you got in your in your water. I mean, that matters for drinking water, obviously, and it's important from an environmental standpoint, but it's not an issue from a, from a microbiological food safety standpoint. Okay, yeah, somebody just submitted a comment here um, that he thinks that nowadays um, the kits are running between about 40 and $70 and that they test for coliform, E. coli, turbidity, and nitrates. Yeah, that's, I, I think you can, I think different places are going to have different price ranges and, and different specifications for what they're looking for. And I, th I think this is something that Erin's going to be addressing in more detail two weeks down the road here uh, when she talks about what the actual Food Safety Modernization Act rules are going to be. Um, but but that's, uh, you know, as far as, as far as recommendations for just for general food safety, I'd, I'd stand by what you really want to be looking at is the, is the amount of E. coli in your well water that you're using in your wash tank. Okay. Um, what are the options for organic hard surface and wash water sanitizers? Mm, I wish I had a better answer for this. Um, the, the ones that we used on my farm were both Ecolab products. We liked the Ecolab product because I could just go down and pick that up at the local dairy supply house. So for the wash water sanitizer, we used a product called... Um, Tsunami, I think it was Tsunami 100, so that's T-S-U-N-A-M-I, T-S-U-N-A-M-I, um, and then we used, a, we used a product called Oxonia Active, so this was also from Ecolab as our hard surface sanitizer. These are both paracetic acid or peroxyacetic acid compounds, which means that they're, they're made from acetic acid and hydrogen peroxide. They're extremely caustic and need to be handled with a lot of care in their concentrated form. But once they're in the wash water and then, and then as they break down in the environment, they're extremely benign. There are some other formulations out there. Um, I know that uh, I, I, I'm thinking there's a, um, oh shoot. Um, 
I'm sure it'll come back to me as soon as we get off the webinar. Johnny's has a Johnny's has a product I believe that can be used for both applications, which might be suitable for uh, for your farm. It, I think it really depends on the scale of your farm and how much material you're going through, uh, how that how that all costs out. Um, but yeah, there there are a variety of formulations out there for that. If you if you do a, and and those are both the the nice thing about the tsunami and the oxonia is they're both OMRI approved. If you do use something like a chlorine bleach, I get conflicting answers about whether that's actually acceptable in an organic circumstance. Um, I don't like chlorine. I don't. Uh, there's some research out there that indicates that it's not as effective as the parasitic acid sanitizers, uh, especially in the presence of of dirt and organic matter. Okay. And and then, um, which of course is a lot of where we are. Like we're going to have some dirt, some organic matter going on, almost no matter where we're at in the wash process. Uh, so and the other thing with chlorine is that it's it's very volatile, so it changes a lot in your tank. It very much depends on your pH, how effective it's going to be, and might change the concentrations you need to use. The the parasitic acids are a little bit more flexible. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's always a good idea to check with your certifier too. We always recommend that. Um, okay, so here's a question. After you've gone to all the trouble to ensure food safety on your farm, a toddler uses his hand to wipe his snotty nose and then picks up 10 different bunches of carrots, I guess, at the market. So how do you help consumers know how to keep food clean? I don't. Consumers are hopeless. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, th this really comes down to, I think, uh, you know, all I can do is all I can do. You know, it's, it's what I I have to do what I can control, and and I I lose control. I mean, you, you talk about a farmers market scene now. If you go to, I, well, I don't know if it's still this way. I remember when I was a kid. I grew up in Seattle, so we'd we'd go to Pike's Place Market, uh, and the the produce vendors there. You weren't allowed to touch the produce. Uh, they they picked out the product. You could point to things that you wanted, but you said, hey, you know, I want I want two bunches of carrots, and they got you the two bunches of carrots that you were going to get. Um, rather than rather than having people come in contact with the produce, it makes sense from a food safety standpoint, but it's certainly not the culture that we have at most farmers markets. Yeah. But I mean, that would be I mean, obviously, like I said, I mean, that's about the only solution there is. Otherwise, you really are looking at trying to say on an individual basis, you know, hey, you have to be careful about these things with food safety. But most of the foodborne illness issues that happen on a, on a one, you know, happen one at a time because somebody doesn't do a good job in their kitchen. You know, I mean, that's really where the risks are with this. It's 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 not with the farmers, but we can control, but that doesn't mean that, that we don't take the steps that we can to control it. It's it, I always think of it's kind of like going out, you know, you, you get in your car, you put your seatbelt on, you're probably not going to get an accident. I mean, I, I've been in, I've been in two accidents in the entire time that I've been driving. Um, and and uh, you know so you're probably not going to get in an accident, but if you do, then you know maybe it's your fault, maybe it's somebody else's fault. You know, but you still have to protect. You you do what you can do to prevent it happening. You know, you can't really do something about the about the drunk driver barreling down the road. Okay. Um, somebody suggested having handouts at food safe about food safety at the farm stand and signs at the entrance of the farmers market and talking with customers and also submitted some resources, so I'll share those in just a moment after awesome. I ask the next question here. Um, can you repeat the color coding? Somebody wanted to know, uh, was it green for handling and washing, blue for scrubbing food surfaces, and red for non-food contact surfaces? You've got it. And, you know, we, we just tried to go with kind of a logical approach, right? Green is, green is food safe, and, and a lot of our food, of course, we're vegetable farmers, so it's colored green. Red is sort of a no-go. That's the most dangerous stuff. You wouldn't want to put that on the food. We used blue because um, we had bought a bunch of blue buckets earlier, early in our business as, our, as our, first, uh, our first harvest containers, and we still had those. So we were kind of like, well, and the packing shed was blue, so we were like, oh, blue. Um, I tried to find like standards for this, and I couldn't find that like there's any any accepted standard. If you go from one farm to another, that you're necessarily gonna, or one, you know, if you go out into a restaurant world, that you're necessarily going to find, uh, you know, one re one standard way of doing this. Uh, I think the colors are probably just gonna vary, and we did, you know, again, that was the blue, the red and the green made sense to us, and then the as as a logic thing, and then the blue was really about other things that we had on our farm, the color of the packing shed, color of the buckets that we were using. 
Okay, um, Chris, here's a question about clothes. What are your thoughts on specific clothes for the washing shed versus the field? Um, my thoughts on that is uh, a little heretical here, but I would say um, I feel like it's a low yield for a lot of effort to say that people have to have different clothes for those different spaces. Now what I will say is if you're going to go out in the field and work with your chickens, you know, then I think you need to think about either wearing coveralls out to work with the chickens um, or changing your clothes. You might want to think about changing your boots if you've been working with livestock. Um, certainly a lot of farms have dedicated boots for the packing shed area. Um, that can again get expensive, um, and I'm and I'm concerned about that. You know, I mean, a decent pair of boots is you know 20, 30 bucks, and having enough sizes for everybody that's on your farm, and they, you know, all of those issues. I I don't know. You know, that's it seems like a lot of work and a lot of expense for for not a lot of yield on it. Um, at the same time, I think being being common sense about it and asking what are the what are the chances that I've had some source of contamination uh, while I was out doing the other things on my farm, maybe I need to take some steps then to mitigate that. The one thing I do really encourage folks to do is to uh, look into uh, good quality bib overalls and aprons for um, for the people who are working in your packing shed. I do think that people in the packing shed should definitely be in rubber boots. Um, they're very cleanable. Uh, you know, they, 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 they don't carry a lot of contamination. And the aprons help people stay dry, which I think actually has an effect on food safety because people who are dry and warm and comfortable are, have enough focus to pay attention to other things. When you're when you're wet and miserable, and trust me, I mean I, I, I worked on a on a fish processing ship in Alaska. When you're wet and cold and miserable, you're not paying much attention to anything else other than the the rudiments of the job that you have in front of you. So I really want people to be able to pay attention to more than just the rudiments. So keeping them dry makes sense. And that also then becomes, if you, if you require something like an apron in your packing shed, it's not quite as good as coveralls. It's not quite as good as changing your clothes. But it's an additional layer of protection that's fairly easy to have and enforce. Okay. Um, this is kind of along those lines. Um, talking about different um, packing boxes or crates. Um, for example, um, this person says that um, her, on her farm, they cure onions in the field for a few days before placing them in a large pallet-sized crate for further curing. The wooden crates combine the durability and breathability necessary for this, but they're hard to sanitize. Um, so is using wooden crates in this way a problem for food safety? And someone else asked about wa reusing waxed cardboard boxes. So do you have thoughts on wooden crates and waxed cardboard boxes? All right. So. I'm going to do, again, I'm going to be a little unorthodox here in, in my approach to this. And I'm going to say, let's talk about the wood first. Um, there actually, so there's not, I shouldn't say there's not. I haven't seen any research that talks about the relative safety of, of wooden containers for fresh produce versus plastic containers for fresh produce. We, we have uh, in, our, in our society a, a tendency to think of plastic as being clean, um, the, but the, re, there is research out there, uh, you know, and this is published, published uh, you know, uh, vetted research that says that wood cutting boards are actually much safer than plastic cutting boards because of the antimicrobial properties of, and self-healing properties of the wood. So um, you know, even, even after it's been cut down for a long time, it still has those antimicrobial properties in it, and it still has a tendency to kind of close up wounds on it, into itself. So you know, I, I think there's a, a good argument for the idea that, that using wood containers is a, should be a safe and acceptable thing to do. My big issues with, with the wood is, are going to be how, how readily can you clean it? Um, I mean, obviously, again, it's wood. It's not plastic. But, you know, thinking about how it's constructed and the various nooks and crannies that might be in there and can you actually get in and clean those. Um, and then I'm, I'm also going to be thinking about... Um, Oh, what was the other thing I was going to be thinking about with that? I'd say mostly with the cleaning aspect on it. And then, and then I guess the other thing I might think about is, is what's the food safety risk of the food? You know, onions in general are, are not 
you know, I wouldn't consider that as high risk of a food as, say, you know, tomatoes or um, or salad greens, for example. So I might I might have a different approach with those with those two crops and feel more comfortable with onions and wooden bins. Um, I'd certainly hate to see us losing the ability to use wood, and it's unclear from the FDA what's going to happen with the with the produce rule with the Food Safety Modernization Act with that. The other question being regarding reusing wax boxes, again, um, I'm not aware of any research that says one thing or the other. I do think that, I mean, the wax is designed to reduce the, um, you know, reduces the ability of, of water to, to penetrate, which means it, it has a sheeting action, which means that it's going to be less likely that other things stick. To me, the scariest part about reusing wax boxes is is not what you do on your farm, but it's what your customers do with them. Um, you know, I've I've seen pictures uh, on CSA uh, uh, sites on on Facebook of of uh, you know babies standing in in their diapers in <laughs> CSA boxes. Um, I've seen customers carrying things that don't clearly don't belong in CSA boxes in them. Um, I've been a CSA member, and I I, I hate to admit I you know. When I when I didn't think about it any better, I I did the same thing. Um, you know, a box is a box for most people who are out there. So I think I think there is some risk involved in that. Um, again, I I I struggle here because I was a farmer who reused CSA boxes and I reused wholesale boxes. Uh, the the big thing that I'd say from a food safety standpoint, if you want to reuse those boxes, is get a liner to go in the box and that. Once you put a liner in it, now it's basically considered to be a new container. So, uh, I mean, that would be, you know, if you, if you really wanted to take care of it from a food safety perspective, that would be the thing to do. Otherwise, I mean, any, any container that you're reusing really should probably be being cleaned and sanitized with, with each use. But, man, what a nightmare that's going to become. And I, just, I don't have a good answer for that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you know of any guides to setting up a packing area based on the size of an operation? No. Okay. No. Um, the one that I would look at is is uh, there was just one that came out from CIAS, uh, Center for Integrated Ag Studies, John Hendrickson, and uh, and Scott Stanford on storage spaces. Uh, and sizing those, particularly with regards to fall vegetable production, and I, I do believe that that covered some um, that covered some information about about the. Uh, sorry, I'm 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 stuttering there. Um, that covered some information about about how to set up your packing area as well. Okay, um, let's see. Um, it's kind of a. Okay, here's a question. How would you find a location to test, um, to, to do water testing in any region of the U.S.? Do you have any recommendations on how to find a lab? I feel like I should have an answer for that, and I okay. don't. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes your local extension office can help with that, um, or some sort of local water bureau. I know I had a question about my well water and I kind of looked in the phone book and <laughs> made a bunch of calls, but um, if anybody has any suggestions about that, please feel free to submit them. Um, we can get a better answer for you. Um, let's see. Um, okay. From my understanding, the spinach illness issue from a few years ago was due to bacteria in the irrigation water, and no amount of washing could get the bacteria out of the spinach. It was just absorbed into the plant. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, like most food safety outbreaks, the the causes usually get narrowed down to uh, you know a possibility that it came from two or three different things. Uh, I certainly have heard about the irrigation water issue. Um, I I just I just don't know. Um, irrigation water is a, irrigation water is a is a tricky issue, especially if you're doing uh, any kind of overhead irrigation. Um, it's it's it seems unclear about about the mechanisms for for how bacteria are you know whether they actually get absorbed into the let into the the leaves of the spinach if if you've got irrigation or if it's actually if it's on the surface and maybe it gets you know it gets stuck up in one of those one of those uh, uh, stomas on the bottom of the leaf the stomata on the bottom of the leaf and then you know and then can't get out but yeah I mean you can't 
you if you've contaminated your crop, you can't count on on any sort of a washing process to remove the bacteria, the foodborne pathogens from that crop. I mean, if, if it's contaminated, it's contaminated. Um, usually, if you're dealing with uh, if you're dealing with irrigation water, there's a certain amount of, of die-off time. The old Cornell recommendation was seven days. Uh, the new FDA recommendation depends on on the level of contamination in your water, uh, and, and I think Aaron again is going to be addressing that to some degree here in two weeks. Okay, um, back to harvest bins. Um, how often would you sanitize the ones on your farm? Um, here, just one second. I'm, I'm actually, uh, Alice. I'm giving you a link for the, uh, uh, for the on-farm cold storage uh, book. Okay. Yeah. That's and, available. All right. I'll, I'll share that with post, everyone here. Post, uh, and then also, I just, um, somebody kindly who sort of has a clearer head than we do at the moment, and just submitted the very sensible suggestion that state departments of agriculture should have information on water testing. Um, and I think that is actually where I ended up looking for my own well water. So thanks for that. Yeah. I just shared that. I'd, start, I'd probably start with extension and then and then work out from there. Uh, you know, just from a regulatory standpoint, I I'm always uh, I, I you know it's always nice to stay out of the regulatory eye, um, you know, and deal with the problems on your own as much as possible. So that that I'm sorry, that last question was. Okay. How often do you sanitize the or did you sanitize the harvest bins on your own farm? So we we had plenty of of harvest bins. Uh, we did it once a week. So we used um, we would we would wash and rinse our our totes so that we were you know our, our harvest bins so as they as they came in um, we we used the product out of them we we uh, we rinsed them off sent them back out to the field for more harvest uh, things that were then in the packing shed went into clean totes so we didn't we didn't pack into totes that had been out in the field now on my farm we only had one kind of tote we didn't separate the totes in the packing shed from the totes that were were dedicated for field use but we did keep them separate once they had gone out to the field they went in separate piles from the totes that were clean and in the packing shed and then once a week on Friday afternoons we would we would uh, clean and san we'd actually go through the, the formal process of cleaning and sanitizing every tote that had been used on the farm in the previous week wow. okay um, what are the safety issues or precautions about using compost containing broken down manure in the planting process well, and, and I, I didn't choose to address this as one of my 10 points because, you know, for most organic farmers, we're already following, uh, if, if it's not completely broken down, if it's not fully composted, then it, it does under that raw manure standard uh, under the, the National Organic Program, which is 90 days for uh, applications that don't come in contact with the harvestable portion of the food and 120 days for, for applications that do or are likely to come in contact with the harvestable portion of the food. Um, I'd say the thing about compost is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get, um, to, to, to get compost fully 100% composted. You know, even the best uh, even the best piles have stuff that doesn't get 100% thoroughly mixed. So um, I'd say I think it's really a, a use caution. Uh, try to spread as put as much time between the uh, the manure or the compost application and the harvest of the crop as you possibly can. But at a minimum, follow those those national organic program standards, which were based on on good science that is is I think still valid. Uh, you know, the the other thing to think about with this, and, and one of the things I like talking about, talking to organic groups about this, is that the uh, when when you use um, when you're putting manure on and incorporating manure into organically active soils, so bi or I should say biologically active soils, so soils that are under organic management and that you're doing a good job of keeping the soil biology, that actually reduces the the longevity or the survivability of foodborne pathogens. They don't do well in that environment, um, as as we would generally say about pathogens. You know, for the most part, right? They don't do well in that environment. There's all kinds of other good things that are out there, uh, eating them up and taking advantage of the fact that that's actually not the environment that they're designed 
uh, from an evolutionary standpoint to survive well in. So um, I'd say again, you know, good good organic management. If you can apply it to a soil maybe that that has uh, that has a cover crop on it, or even um, I mean, I, I would I would and again I'm I'm speculating here. I can't say this. What I've set up until now is backed up by research. I'm speculating on this next piece, but you know, if you're say you're going to turn over a salad crop, right, and put another salad crop in, if you're farming in an environment that lets you, maybe you would take and spread your compost on the first salad crop after you've harvested it, so you're done. Spread the compost, till that in, because even there you're going to get a flush of biological activity coming off of tilling in the greens and the roots that are left in the field. Okay, and then you know even even if it was just plain compost, that's going to help to break down anything that we might not want to have in there. So I think so kind of, kind of trying to have that sort of a of a of a of a mindset with it. With the Food Safety Modernization Act, the they actually don't have a rule yet about the manure because the research is so inconclusive out there about what what are safe uh, withdrawal periods for when you should be applying manure, or, or pre, I should say pre-application intervals, so between applying the manure and, and harvest. They don't have a good, they don't have a good, uh, a good idea on that. There's, the science is, is, is not conclusive. Okay, I think we'll, we'll do one last question here, and um, that is, do you have any comments or recommendations on food safety for aquaponics, meaning fish and plants in the same water, but only the plant's roots in the water? So it's my it's my understanding that um, bacteria don't the food, foodborne pathogens don't do a good job of trans of of moving from the roots up to the leaves. So if what you're doing is growing a crop like lettuce or tomatoes in an aquaponics, it, what I'd want to do is to stay away from the water. I'd want to take every every step that I could do to keep. Uh, my tools, my clothes, my boots, my containers, and my crop from coming in contact, my, the edible portion of my crop, from coming in contact with the aquaponics water. Because, you know, if you got fish water, then basically you got poop water, right? So I'd want to, I'd want to keep those two things as separate as I could. That being said, I, I don't know if fish carry salmonella. I don't know, I don't know what kind of risks there are with that. Um, but but I think, again, I, I would go with the keep the poop off the food uh, rule of thumb there and just say anything you can do to keep those, to keep the food and anything that is going to come in contact with the food separate from the, the, the growing water in that situation would be, would be how I'd approach that from a theoretical standpoint. Okay, well, thank you. We are running out of time, um, and I'd like to thank everyone for participating and submitting questions. Thank you so much, Chris, for giving this great presentation, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having me on, Alice. This was really great. I really appreciated the fantastic questions at the end. That was that was one of the best question and answer sessions I've been in on food safety. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for participating in that and for showing up today.